Hello, my friends. I am back. Okay, so I attempted uh, Blue Review episode 86 <laughs> with my best uh, first time views of 2021. Well, I got into it. I got, you know, several films into it, and I was going to pause, check on something I was cooking, and I turned it off. Now, I re-recorded, and then I did the same thing again. So I've recorded parts, part one twice. I'm going to go with the second take of part one. Uh, and I'm just going to split it up, because right there at the end of part one, it says, I'm going to attempt to pause this. The attempt did not work. So uh, I am starting then uh, with part two now uh, of episode 86 still. I don't like breaking these up like that, I like every episode be its own number. But I, I usually do this when things like that happen, when I'm really in the middle of something and some kind of technical glitch happens far into it. I don't want to go back and re-record it. In this case, I did go back and re-record it, but it happened again. So I'm not, I'm not going to go for a third take on that one. So, all that having been said, uh, barring any further uh, errors... I'm going to jump back into this. Uh, I'm doing my, uh, yeah, best views of 2021. Best first time views uh, of 2021. Uh, I do, I have 30. Uh, I only got through to number eight. So let's jump forward here. Uh, like I've said before, a lot of these I have covered on this channel before. I've reviewed them in shows. So I'm not going to go super in depth on all these. Uh, but the next one, number nine, is We Are the Flesh. Uh, Tenemos la Carne by Emiliano Rocha Minter, uh, 2016. Uh, it is a fucked up movie. Um, I really like it, though. I think it's one of the more extreme films I saw this year, and one of the more interesting extreme films. One of the most interesting extreme films uh, that I saw this year. Um you know, it, it wasn't very long, and it was kind of, I don't know, it, it, it's crazy. Basically, you have these two siblings, and they're wandering the city uh, for years. It's like a post-apocalyptic kind of thing. Uh, they're looking for food and shelter, and they see this kind of, uh, they get inside a building for shelter, and they see this uh, madman who's just kind of raving, and man, he's just a wide open dude, the character, the actor, he's just, he's pretty, he's kind of a revelation. Um, and he rants and philosophizes, and eventually he just makes these two uh, siblings, a male and female, just perform all these weird acts. And of course, you know, part of it is sexually, sexual acts with each other. Um, you know, there's a lot of shots that are just super gratuitous. Uh, and yeah, in my opinion, they're they're always artistically done and inter or very authentic. Like there's a matter of fact shot where the girl's um, crouching and she's talking to the character, you know, and she's got her her pants down. She just starts urinating on the floor, and you think about where they're at, and I don't know. It didn't seem unnatural. It was almost like an animal thing because. This is the only place they have, you know, indoors. They don't have, like, a bathroom or anything. And, of course, the actress is really doing it and, you know, going through the scene. So, yeah, there's nothing really taboo in this film. I mean, there's very almost nothing left of the imagination. Uh, there's no, like, coprophagia or coprophilia or any of that, thank goodness. But everything else is pretty much out there. Uh, I don't know if the sex is... Mm, some of it's simulated and some of it isn't. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I know, I know, but I have a totally different moral barometer than a lot of people. Every, anybody watching my movies, my movies, ugh, the movies I would make to frighten the world, um, watching my videos knows that. So when I go into a work of art, like I've said before, I kind of check my morality at the door. I try to engage the work on its own terms. Uh, I don't try to be a reaction. I try not to be a reactionary to a work of art. I try to judge it within its context. And um, I mean, if I emotionally react to it, uh, you know, in a good way, then that's obviously going to make an impact on how I perceive it. But, I, you know, I do think of technical things like how well made it is, how well done it is. 
how well constructed it is. And I try to balance that with the emotional side. I mean, some things have a visceral reaction, but I can kind of, there aren't many movies that repel or disgust me any very many well-made overall interesting movies that repel or disgust me to the point where I reject their formal qualities. Um, you know, and he, you know, even then I can make concessions, but those things that there are a few, sometimes there's something visceral that can make me not necessarily hate the movie, but reject it as in it's not going to be something that I'm going to want to watch again or support but I'm not going to like denounce it and say ban it and destroy it either, you know. But we've had this conversation on this channel before. We Are the Flesh, I think it's pretty incredible. Um, <laughs> I'm a weirdo. Okay, so the next one is uh, Mechanics. This is a short, kind of strange uh, French film. Um, a lot of um, kind of dark fairy tale kind of things. It's a Fantasia, kind of a... Um, a lot of stop motion animation with weird kind of skeletal creatures, um, you know, and like a lot of, you know, really short kind of artsy films, uh, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. A lot of the subtext of the movie, you know, the movie is, is the story is portrayed uh, visually more than narratively. I mean, the narrative has really not much, if any, words. Um, so a lot of the subtext that the author's trying to get across through the images are really just kind of in his mind, unless he states it in some kind of manifesto with the movie. Uh, I would, for example, I'd say uh, Begotten by Elias Morhige is like that, Morhige is like that, where, you know, you, you can watch the thing and there's not much telling you what it means, but he himself has written a good bit about it. Uh, Kenneth Anger's movies are kind of like that. You know, Stan Brackage's movies. Uh, you know, a lot of experimental and underground kind of seemingly non-narrative movies, non-traditionally narrative, like with no dialogue and, and things. So uh, mecha mechanics is kind of similar to that. I, I liked it, but an interesting look. Um, next up is uh, Takashi Miike's First Love. Uh, I don't remember as much about this movie as I'd like to. I definitely want to see it again, but I do think it was another kind of winner from Miike. Uh, he, he's incredible. He rarely disappoints. Sometimes, but you know, I mean, the guy's made like hundreds of movies, so you, you can't win them all. Um, but this one I, I thought was really good. Um, so I'm not going to try to recap it. I did review it on this channel. You can track these down. Uh, I think in the same video I reviewed this, I reviewed the next one. I'm going to talk about briefly Massacre Mafia, Snob by Dick Mitchell. Uh, now, of course, this guy, you know, was an actor, comedian, kind of lounge singer guy. And then late in his life, he started directing films, and he did these two kind of very rough-hewn, uh, violent, kind of gritty crime movies, uh, one which I don't think was finished when he died, Gone with the Pope, but has been finished since. Uh, I still haven't seen that, but uh, the other one's Must Massacre Mafia style. It's very 70s. It's very low budget. It's very raw, but it's very authentic. There's a lot of autobiographical stuff of Duke Mitchell in it. Um, apparently, he really was Italian, and I mean, I'm not sure if his family's in the mafia or not, but, you know, a lot of it doesn't stray far from some of his roots, and uh, it's great. It, it just has a great vibe to it. Uh, Grindhouse Releasing, I believe, put that out on Blu-ray. Uh, the next one would be, on my list here, would be Manson Family uh, by Jim Van Bever, and what can I say? It took him a year to make it, and it's kind of pretty much the definitive Charles Manson movie. Um, it's got everything and more that you could want out of a Charles Manson movie. Um, the next one is one that I meant to review on here, and I never did, but intend to. More length, uh, Mova Express, a 2009 movie, which is uh, really a compilation of, of segments uh, that this indie uh, filmmaker uh, finally kind of sewed together into one film, more or less. And what it is is uh, pieces of... Uh, from and inspired by Nova Express. You know, they're all pretty much from Nova Express by William S. Burroughs. A lot of them are, are readings by him, and then some are readings by other people of, from the book. And then the visuals are cobbled together, some from Burroughs, of Burroughs, some from the Burroughs Balk films that I've mentioned, with uh, Burroughs and Brian Geisen, and uh, directed by Anthony Balk. 
And then some footage is just like all kinds of found footage, random juxtaposed, kind of like um, Church of the Subgenius film Arise, where they stitch all this different crazy footage from all these different wild and science fiction movies and, and stock footage uh, together to kind of create a narrative. Uh, and then they do a good job of this in, in uh, Nova Express. I really, really like the way that the images, the way they're put together with Burroughs narration, especially and some of the sounds in the background. Uh, I really liked it. It's pretty hypnotic. I've, I've watched it about 10, 10 times. So I need to get on the ball and review it. Uh, the next movie, uh, halfway through here, Mobius by um, a much used title and, and name. Mobius by uh, Kim Ki Duke. Uh, not sure what year it came out. 2013. Now, this is my most watched video, except for my early short ones. It's my most watched Blue Review video. It's got like 700 or 800 likes. I mean, views only has like four likes. Uh, I don't know why so many people watch it. I think because Mobius is such a common name uh, and term and, and whatever uh, title. Maybe people accidentally, they search it out and they go, oh, and they kind of see this little avatar of a crazed Japanese woman and go, what's this about? And it is kind of about a crazed Japanese woman, but it's really more about her son. You know, essentially she gets mad at the, the her husband's infidelity, uh, tries to take it out on the dad. It doesn't work and takes it out on the son, cuts his penis off. And then the whole movie kind of explores in extreme detail and <laughs> all the weird travails revolving around his lost penis and pretty much everything you could imagine and a lot of things you probably couldn't or wouldn't want to imagine and a lot of it i hate to say it is very comedic because it's so absurd but it is very dark and it's played straight and the other thing is the movie has no dialogue and it's definitely a narrative movie i mean there's sounds and there's you know it's just i didn't even notice that like the first 20 or 30 minutes you know, and then I'm like, I'm not reading any subtitles. Wait, what's the subtitles? And then I'm like, wait, there's no dialogue to translate. Um, I did a big, long review on this one. Uh, I, I was one of my highlights of 2021. It's just so fucked up. Um, what more can I say? Uh, the next movie is Nothing Bad Can Happen, which I also did a, a review of. And, and it's a hard one to get into. It's a hard one. That I don't know when I'll be able to rewatch it. Uh, it hit me pretty hard. It was very sad, very disturbing. Uh, a lot of cruelty in the movie. Uh, it really makes you think about the whole idea, like the main characters, like this kind of wayward kind of punk kid who's into Christ, big time into Christ. And, you know, he's part of kind of an alternative Christian group. And then they all kind of go their separate ways. And he ends up somehow staying with this bizarre guy. I was going to say this bizarre German guy. This is a German movie. They're all German. But this guy is just, I don't know, he's like something out of a uh, Fassbender outtake. Um, and I don't mean that in a good way. Um, but him and his wife and the family, they're just, they're except for the daughter, they're all, they're curious about him and they kind of take him in, but then they gradually start to fuck with him and manipulate him and then torture him. And then it gets way, way worse than that. Um, it's powerful. So I would recommend it, but with the caveat that it isn't like a lot of the movies I've just mentioned. I mean, it's kind of, it, it brings you down to kind of the human level. And I don't know if you ever have been or not or are. I used to be a Christian, very, very much like this guy, kind of turn the other cheek and then let the other cheek get bloody. And just keep taking it and forgiving. And of course, I'm not nothing like that now. But I remember it well. And it's uh, it's crushing. And I, I understand what this guy went through. But fortunately for me, the people who fucked with me when I was like that did stop at a certain point. Uh, in, not so much in their verbal and, and emotional harassment, but they did stop at a certain point in their physical assaults on me. But in this movie, they, they don't stop. They keep going, and he keeps forgiving, and it's bad. Next one, I just want to go through real quick, Color Out of Space, which was done by my friend Richard Stanley, um, 2019, with Nicolas Cage. I only watched it once. I would like to see it again. 
Uh, I still haven't decided how I feel about it as an adaptation of Lovecraft. I know Richard is happy with it, but I mean, you know, he made it. Um, he co-wrote it and directed it, and he directed it, and um, it's pretty twisted. There are some very twisted segments, especially near the end, and some interesting photography. Uh, I like it. Um, the next movie I really liked a lot, Only Lovers Left Alive. I wasn't sure I was going to like it. Um, thought it might be just an overdose kind of a goth angst, but I thought it was pretty well done. It was one of Jim Jarmusch's uh, genre movies where... And those are my favorite movies by him. I mean, I'm not knocking the more conversational, humanistic kind of indie movies he did early on and then scattered throughout. But the ones where he takes like a genre and then does his own kind of take on it, like Dead Man with the Western or Ghost Dog with like hip hop crime meets samurai film. And this one is his take on the vampire thing. And um, Tilda Swinton is in it. And, uh, you know, I... I respect her as an actress. She annoys the hell out of me in a lot of movies, though. <laughs> and that's kind of blasphemous. She has a huge fan base, um, but I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I like her in this movie. And uh, her lover in the movie, uh, who is much younger, well, in real life, much younger, almost young enough to be her son in real life, but uh, much younger as in, I guess, her character's like many thousands of years old, and his character's maybe only several hundred years old. Um played by Tom Hiddleston, and, and he's great. I mean, this really helps cement my love for him. Uh, I saw this movie after High Rise, uh, and of course after the Marvel movies, and before the Loki show came on, and, and so it fit all that together, and, and with the Night Manager, too. I, he's really one of my favorite current actors overall. Um, next up is Pieta, another Kim Ki Duke tormented, depressing, uh, very perverse film. Maybe I should leave it at that. I, I don't want to say I liked it, but I respect it. it you know, it, it went some really fucked up places. The ending was not the best payoff, but it was a twist that I didn't see coming. I'll say that. Um, yeah. Next one is James Batman from 1966. I never reviewed this. The strange Filipino James Bond slash Batman parody. Um, you know, and it, the same actor plays both of them. It's insane. I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of these kind of knockoff movies from other countries, especially like the Turkish, like the Turkish Batman, Turkish you know, Tarzan, uh, Dracula in Istanbul, which I actually, that's a really good one. A lot of the Turkish ones are really either really fun or silly, or like the Dracula in Istanbul, actually pretty well done and interesting. Um, but the Filipino ones, I haven't seen a lot of knockoff ones from there. I know, I'm familiar with some. This one's pretty delightful, so... Uh, let's move on with Sunshine by Danny Boyle, written by Alex Garland. I reviewed that. Great cast with Michelle Yeoh and Cillian Murphy and Chris Evans um, and uh, Benedict Wong and, you know, a bu bunch of other people I'm forgetting. Rose Byrne. Um, yeah, beautifully shot. Pretty good science fiction movie, you know. Um, I actually think it's a better, a better film than... Uh, 28 Days Later, which they collaborated on. Yeah, which I do, I do like that one. Um, next is She Never Died. I never got around to reviewing this, and I have forgotten a lot about it. But essentially, it's a, a sequel slash companion piece to the film He Never Died, uh, with uh, Henry Rollins as this immortal guy. You more or less realize by the end of the movie it's Cain, uh, as in Cain and Abel from the Bible. Uh, she Never Died... Uh, is a character named Lacey, played by Olga Nike Adelui. Uh, I can't say her name. I'm sorry I butchered that. Uh, she basically preys uh, on, well, she's basically like an immortal, too. But she's basically a cannibal. Vampire, more of a cannibal. Uh, and she's like this intense uh, black woman, African, I think she's an African actress. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, I really like it. I don't, and I'm not sure if it's even the same director as He Never Died. I don't, it's not. Same producers. Maybe the same writer, I'm not sure. Um, let me check. It is the same writer. Uh, but I think it's good. I like to do a double feature of them sometimes. Okay, so, um, High Wacket I reviewed on here. I think it's a really good modern occult film. I think the main actress in this 
teenage actress is really good. Uh, I really think it, it, the way it details all the stuff about the spell and everything is, you know, I don't want to say accurate. It depends on what your view of magic is and the occult. Uh, something that I've studied a good bit. I, I practiced a little, but, you know, my ex-fiance is, is, you know, is a witch and an astrologer and a tarot reader a mystic. And, I mean, I've known several people like that, more females than males, which is love me, I don't know what to say. Um, but I, I love them too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's something I've read a lot about. It's a lot of, it's not something I talk a lot about or really practice m manifesting uh, overtly in my life. Like I once tried to do, but it's, it's a huge factor of Flickr Street, my story, huge. I can't underestimate that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about that in my Flickr Street videos and my videos about my ex-fiance said, so blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I thought Pi Wacket went through the occult, the ritual part of it, in a really interesting and believable way. Just like uh, what would be called a dark song from a couple of years ago also did. I, I, I've never reviewed it. I haven't. I don't think I've ever mentioned this channel, but uh, you know, it's a good one too. It's a kind of a rich, recent one that also I, I think the ritual part of it was very believable and compelling. Um, so the next movie um, we're going to talk about is Black Gun. Not not very long, but I believe that's from 1972, and it's the director I'm really not familiar with named uh, Robert Hartford Davis. I think he's a white director. This is a black exploitation film with the great James Brown. James Brown, whoops. No, not the great James Brown, the actor. Jim Brown, who was probably born James Brown. Brenda Sykes, uh, Luciana Pelosi is in this, and Martin Landau is the villain. Timothy Brown from uh, Nashville, uh, and also from, uh, what's that black exploitation movie Timothy Brown is in? Mean Mother or Black Heat? Both Al Adamson shot her in the same time. Uh, anyway, that's that Timothy Brown. Um, I know I gave the movie a bad review on Shock Cinema. Not a bad review, but kind of mocking, and I kind of mocked Timothy Brown's acting. And that was before I'd seen him in Nashville. Anyway, get Bernie Casey is really, really, really good in this, in a sporting role. Um, Black Gun, he's a guy named Gun, and G went in, and he, he owns a nightclub. Uh, you know, his brother's in trouble with the law. His brother's like a black militant, and I don't know. It's really gritty, and, and, and uh, you know, Landau, of course, plays your typical black exploitation villain. He's just a loathsome white guy, and you know, so his lieutenants are just even more loathsome. They're all just like the most unctuously racist people you, you could ever imagine walking the earth. Um, and, you know, that does not bother me. A lot of white people are really uptight about that kind of stuff. You know, why are you stereotyping us? And why are they? And it's like, dude, man, first of all, it's a movie. It's a work of fiction. Second of all, in a way, it's not a work of fiction. There are plenty of people like that in real life, especially back in the 70s when this was made, who, who were pretty overt. And I guess in the current era, more and more people are becoming more overt, especially online, in the same way. So I don't really think it's a stretch uh, to say, you know, if, if I were a black dude in that movie or in that reality in that time or now, and I, 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 I perceived all white people as being hateful, I don't think I'd really be faulted for that. I'm not saying black people should hate all white people. All I'm saying is I, I get it. And I wish more white people did get it. I think we'd have more understanding about this whole thing. But anyway, keep telling yourself about this one. Keep telling yourself it's only a movie. It's only a movie. But yes, there are white cracker racists like that in real life. And unfortunately, there's not a Jim Brown to beat the shit out of them. Um... So, yeah, I mean, there is a Jim Brown, but he's pretty old now. I mean, he's not like Black Gun. Uh, next movie, I did a whole episode on The Skin I Live In, 2011, by Pedro Almodovar. Very haunting movie. Uh, pretty powerful. It is to me, even though a good friend of mine who's a film uh, savant would disagree with me, but it is a riff on the surgical horror genre. Uh, back to films like Eyes Without a Face, Leisure Sans Visage by... George Franju, 1960, or uh, Awful Dr. Orloff, Jess Franco, 62, I think. Um, yeah, though it is a lot deeper and heavier than either of those movies. 
not, not the size without a face isn't somewhat deep and heavy, but uh, this is, you know, it's modern and it's, it's messed up. <laughs> it's really messed up. But uh, Antonio Anderis plays the crazy surgeon uh, with all these gender operation, alteration fetishes. Uh, it's really messed up. Uh, the strange thing about the Johnsons, the first film by the, the I was going to say the great, but I, I'm not a huge fan like, like most people are, but I do like him. Ari Aster, this is well before um, Hereditary or Midsummer, uh, and this is actually a all black cast, and it's the very strange, it's a short film, I mean, it's like a half hour, and it's described here as a dark domestic melodrama satire about the ties that bind and the ties that really bind. Who writes this stuff on Letterboxd? Um, yeah, the, the, the twist here is that, you know, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's familial sexual abuse between a parent and, and child. Okay, and this, there's two twists, double twists. One, which isn't that big a twist, uh, is that uh, it's a father and son. So it's a, you know, I guess, I don't know if I'd call it homosexual because I don't know what I'd call it. this kind of behavior. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's that exactly, but basically it's, it's two men. But the twist is not that the father is molesting the son. It's that the son has been repeatedly raping the father since the son was a teenager. I don't know. It's insane. Uh, some of it seems comical, but a lot of it's kind of depressing. And then some of it's kind of depressing and comical. Uh, some of it's very extreme, but then it's like... Within the movie, like, for instance, the mother is not in on what's happening all these years. So she's kind of seeing it as the audience is like, what the fuck? Is this really happening? And it is. And beyond that point, beyond that point, the son still acts crazy. But the mother gets her. She, she vents and it's pretty beautiful. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the next one, Sheepskin, and I believe this is the Kind of a, a low-budget, uh, maybe shot on high-end video on 2013. Curtis Feeler is the director. Uh, and I like this sum up. A group of punk rockers kidnap a businessman because they believe he's a werewolf. It is cool. I mean, it's really a good conceit. It's well done. Um, the characterization's good. It makes the most of the low budget. Uh, it's well-written. And it's suspenseful. And it's, you know, it's like, what the hell is going on? And then the twist, which isn't really a twist... It's kind of like they spend the whole movie convincing you that what the characters think is true isn't true. So you finally go, oh, and then, spoilers, it turns out it is true. And then it's like, incredible. So, yeah, I like that one. Sheepskin. Check it out if you like werewolf movies. So the next one would be Persona by Ingmar Bergman, 1966. Yes, this is another one I had never seen until 2021. So I get get stoned and, 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 you know, crucified, flogged for this one. Uh, powerful movie. Beautifully shot, of course. Men Nyquist. Black and white. Uh, it's got, you know, Ingmar Bergman's you know, favorites. B.B. Anderson and uh, Lee Allman together again. And, you know, it's an iconic movie. I mean, I've been seeing scenes and stills of it, you know, and parodies of it and references since I was a little kid. I just fucking never saw it. So um, I really need to beef up on my Bergman. I've got a list on Letterboxd. I think I've seen a dozen of his movies. I don't know if I've seen any more than that. I'm kind of embarrassed. But he's somebody I'm starting to explore more. Uh, I need to. Which is ironic because Seven Seal, I first saw in 1992. It was the very first movie with subtitles that I ever uh, rented, that I ever like saw on home video. I was just curious about it, and I... I knew Max von now, of course, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. And, of course, that's another one, of course, that's been ripped on and parodied you know, endlessly over the decades. Uh, still a classic. I did review Virgin Spring on this channel. Uh, I think I did an okay job with it. Uh, that's probably my favorite Bergman of the dozen I've seen. Persona's really good. It's definitely a mind fuck, and it's like, it's not quite what you think it is. And I do think that kind of excuse me, that kind of structure, and then that kind of twist. Uh, I think it's been done many times since then. This may be one of the earlier films I've seen that, that 
mm, that kind of conveys this, uh, you know, it, everything is not as it seems, and it kind of turns the tables, but then still throws some doubt. It's, it's definitely a deep, deep psychological movie, and I, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Uh, so two more to go. You're almost done with me. You're almost through. Okay, so the next one is Effects, which I alluded to uh, in one of my incredible Admiliora morning videos, morning M-O-U-R-N-I-N-I-G. Um, Effects uh, was by this guy named Dusty Nelson. I have no clue who he is. Uh, it came out in 1980, and it's a Romero-related film shot in Philadelphia and, uh, I mean, in Pennsylvania. Sorry, I don't know if it's shot in Philadelphia. It's shot in Pennsylvania. Um, Pittsburgh, maybe, in that area. Uh, but, you know, it's got Romero actors and, and collaborators. It's got John Harrison, uh, who did music for Romero, um, and he is a producer and an actor in it. Uh, Pasquale Bulba, who is, who edited a lot of Romero's movies. He's the co-producer and editor of this movie. Uh, Tom Savini, who acted and did makeup in Romero's movies, acts and does makeup in this. And the the, uh, the male star of this movie is uh, Joseph Pilato, who had a small role in Dawn of the Dead, but it's really known for Captain Rhodes in um, Dawn of the Dead. That's an unforgettable turn. He's really good in this, and he's playing a totally different kind of character than Rhodes. Very sympathetic. Uh, and then the female main character, played by Susan Chapek, I believe. Really good character. This movie had some weird fucking twists, and the ending kind of blew me away. Uh, it's one I definitely want to get on Blu-ray. I think the AGFA, I think it's what it is, is doing a lot of these kind of obscure grindhouse and kind of something weird-like videos. Uh, put it out on Blu-ray. I definitely intend to scoop it up. The very last movie on this list is the most recent one I saw, uh, Gotham 1919 to 1939. Uh, put together in 2020. This one is kind of like that Nova Express one in that it's a lot of segments strung together into a movie kind of after the fact, um, but it is cohesive. Um, but it was kind of done in segments almost as those episodes of a TV show. I think, you know, it's like a mockumentary. What are, it's, you know, it's a faux documentary, uh, kind of like a History Channel, you know, episodes. And basically the idea, it, it's built, built around this a book, which is also kind of, I don't know what you, how you would call the book, but it's kind of along the same lines of, of found footage, mockumentaries whatever, where it's, uh, you know, it's a very meta kind of thing, where the book is called, well, I don't really know what the book is called, Something Something Gotham, but I know it's 1919 and 1939 in it, and basically it's treating the Batman mythos as if it really happened, and as if it happened about a generation before the Golden Age of Batman. So Batman debuted in 1919 instead of 1939, um, and it spans that 20 years, uh, though this is actually kind of like season one so this one kind of spans the, the work, the cohesive one that I'm talking about only really spans 1919 to around 1934. Um, the last five years are going to be in season two, um, which has started on being, uh, you know, uh, the episodes have started dropping on YouTube uh, recently. Um, but basically the book it's based on is like where they make all these kind of photographs that look vintage or sepia tone and you know this whole conceit that it really happened and you know they, they're supposed to be photos from you know the late 19th century up to like the 1930s and that's you know a more realistic and period uh, appropriate uh, look for all the batman characters and, and places and they use a lot of real history to kind of buffer it and then they kind of rethink and realign a lot of the batman mythos to fit better into that era and be more, I guess, realistic to that era. So the book, I think, actually tells the narrative, too. Uh, but anyway, there's this channel called The Bat Feed on YouTube, and basically what they've done is they've strung it into this movie. They've actually, you know, shown the photos from the book as their illustrations while they talk and, and narrate, you know, stories from the book and, and extrapolate on them uh, as though it was a documentary and that these pictures are you know, evidence of what they're really showing historically happened. Um, I like their takes on a lot of those stuff, the Batman mythos. Uh, it's, it's visually, it's really nice. The, the, the photographs look real. They look convincing. They look period uh, appropriate. I will say, though, that 
the chronology's a mess. Um, like, they'll say things like, okay, in 1914, so-and-so, uh, you know, is going off to World War II after college. Okay, then 1919. So the, the Great War's over, and now they're whatever. Okay, so that's five years, right? So they'll show a picture of them in college, ostensibly in 1914. Then in 1919, 1920, they'll show them as their adult, and it's like a different actor portraying the same character, and they're way older. And I know people aged really rough back then, but, you know, like James Gordon is supposed to be a contemporary Bruce Wayne who went to college, allegedly, right before World War II. Or World War I, sorry. Uh, and yet, in the 1920s, he looks like he's about 80. Now, I know a lot of people favor the old, old James Gordon, like, uh, in the old TV series or Pat Hingle in the Tim Burton movies. But, you know, ever since Batman Year One by Frank Miller, we've come accustomed to a James Gordon who's more of a contemporary of Batman than a father-like figure to Batman. I mean, now in, in Titans, the TV series, they show the pictures of Gordon, who supposedly who's dead by then, and he is way, way old to be Barbara's father. So they're kind of fitting into that old... Uh, style, but like I said, since Batman Year One, we've had like, um, well, notably Gary Oldman, uh, you know, playing more age appropriate uh, Gordon, and then J.K. Simmons in the DCEU. Still, you know, J.K. Simmons is not terribly older than Ben Affleck, um, and then in the new Batman, it's going to be Jeffrey Wright, who's not, you know, horribly, horribly older than Robert Pattinson. At least he doesn't look it. Um, so I kind of favor the younger Gordon. So this was kind of the old, old Gordon. Uh, but there's a lot of weird narrative choices in this. And, and uh, like I said, some I agree with, some I don't. Some I think are, you know, they should have just sat down and, and you know, written out a timeline. And then based the photos around the timeline. Uh, whereas, I don't know, I kind of feel like they maybe did the opposite, like, came up with these stories for these different eras, and then tried to kind of, after the fact, jam them together. Uh, and, and in that sense, as a documentary, as a fake documentary, it, it fails, because they rarely cite years that events take place. And when they do, like I said, there, there's all this contradictory information. Now, I will say the season two that's coming out now, which they're up to episode three, it is becoming a little more streamlined, and they are starting to call out the years and you know but by this time you know we've gone through this whole thing and it's almost over despite all this i liked it i think it's an enjoyable entertaining watch and if you like batman and really really you know know a lot about the minutia of his uh mythology like i do i mean i'm not bragging that's just one of those things i came up with being a comics geek um and of course he's you know he's ubiquitous in pop culture now of course a lot of people know this stuff thanks to the movies, but regardless, they go deep in this, though. I mean, they bring out all kinds of obscure characters and more modern, re real recent storylines that I don't know anything about, and some of that stuff fits okay in the period setting, and some of it's a little uneasy, and again, some of the stretches of years is really odd. Like, if you posit, last example, I promise, if you posit the Court of Owls in a modern Batman story, and say they've been behind the scenes influencing all these conspiracies in world history for centuries. So, okay, we're in the early 21st century when the Court of Owls was debuting. So if you say they've been around since, you know, the 19th century, you know, centuries make sense. And it has that sweep to it. But then if you say the Court of Owls has been doing all this for centuries, which they say in this movie, uh... And then you show that they started in the late 19th century and their first, uh, they exert control over Gotham in the 1910s, 1920s, we're, we're talking about. That's not centuries. That's like 50 years, maybe. Uh, so it lacks a lot of that sweep. Having, having, having it happen earlier in history means that, okay, the Court of Owls wasn't behind, like, all these conspiracies of the 20th century. Uh you know, they, they might have had something to do with World War One, and that's about as far as it goes. So uh, it, it, it alters the whole dynamic of that particular concept. I think that's the weakest uh, adaptation point. Anyway, 
so that's my top 30. Sorry to geek out again over comic stuff. Uh, you know, you'll get used to it eventually. Just kidding. Um, I'm going to split because, yeah, I might cut this video off by accident again. So take care. Happy New Year. It's a little after 1 a.m. here. So for some of you guys on the West Coast, if you're going to watch this in the next hour, you still might not be to New Year's. So I'm, I'm here in 2022, so I can tell you already, you're really not missing anything. So far, nothing's really different. I'm waiting, though. I'm waiting for some improvements. Take care, and I'll be back soon. Thanks. Seriously, happy holidays.